right, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Philemon. And uh, Philemon, uh, the book right before the book of Hebrews. And uh, praise the Lord, we just finished the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and those three books make up a pastor's manual. And uh, oh, shows the inner workings of church ministry and church work. Then we get to the little teeny book of Philemon, 25 verses long, one chapter. Uh, now, one chapter doesn't make it an insignificant book. One chapter uh, that is power-packed, uh, a great lesson uh, that I believe we can all use today about Onesimus and Philemon, and it should be interesting. This stands for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read this evening verses 10 through 16, and uh, let's read those uh, seven verses all together in unison. Are you ready? Yes, sir. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more to thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And on, it's okay. <laughs> Brother Randy's back. Uh, the book of Philemon, a tremendous story about a runaway slave who gets gloriously saved and sent back to his master and uh, with the urging for him not to be a servant but a brother beloved. A tremendous, tremendous little book in the Bible. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we do love you. It's been a good night so far, a good spirit. I believe you've met with us, Lord, tonight. And uh, I believe you have a plan for us tonight as we learn these 25 verses. And God, I pray that you help us to open our hearts and our minds and in some ways be challenged tonight. And I think about Onesimus returning to Philemon. And uh, when he was returning, the anxiety, the not knowing what was going to happen, the uncertainty, and Onesimus held that letter in his hands, gave it to Philemon. Philemon opened that letter, Lord, and had some serious pondering to do, some decisions to make, and Paul encouraged him. And God, I pray that you help us to realize the encouragement and the challenge that Philemon uh, had many Years ago, often we can be challenged in our own lives, Lord. I pray that you help us to not run from those challenges, but accept those challenges, Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, the book of Philemon. This is an interesting story in the Bible. Amen. amen. An interesting story in the Bible. Praise the Lord. And uh, I haven't uh, brought out a map in a while right here. I thought I would get a map going right here. Oh, yeah. Uh, a map, and uh, praise the Lord, we have our wonderful Spain right here. Oh, we go over to our Italian boots, and uh, then we go over to Greece, and uh, I know it looks beautiful, doesn't it? That's what you're saying. And then we go over there, there's the, uh, the Black Sea, we come down here, and we go over here, this would be where Jerusalem is the Dead Sea, the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee. Then we come up over here. Uh, we have the wonderful Nile River, the Red Sea. And uh, praise God, we have Crete right here, the island of Cyprus right here. Now, uh, the Apostle Paul was in a city called Rome. And uh, he was in bondage for the cause of Christ. But you think about it, the Apostle Paul, he, he just uh, preached the word. Uh, he sort of lived that, and all, should, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, and Paul did suffer persecution. He was in Rome, in prison. 
Uh, over yonder in this place was a city called Colossae, and I'm spelling that right, wrong. I think it's one L right there, Colossae, right there, one Colossae. And uh, there was a church there, and a man named Philemon was part of that church. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. We're going to look at this verse as you're turning there. We're turning to Colossians chapter 4, verse 9. And it says, with Onesimus. Do you see that? Verse number 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. And uh, most people, we look at Onesimus, found right there in Colossians chapter 4, uh, became part of that church in Colossae. And uh, it seems like Philemon was from Colossae right there. He was a saved man. And it's interesting, uh, you have to understand, and I'm going to tell you the story. The story of, by the way, Onesimus is a good name, isn't it? I like Onesimus. And praise God, uh, Nehemiah Onesimus Netasant. And uh, that's my youngest son, Nehemiah. His middle name is Onesimus. And uh, praise the Lord right here from the book of Philemon. Uh, but this story of Onesimus, you think about it, the Roman Empire, headquartered really, you think of the main city of Rome right there, had a struggle, a big struggle. They estimated that uh, at this time, half of the population were slaves. You think with me. Half of the population in the Roman Empire were slaves. Many people would uh, think about the Roman Empire. One of the downfalls of the Roman Empire was uh, slavery got even greater that later on, where they estimate that three quarters of the population uh, of the Roman Empire right there were slaves. There were masters and there were slaves. They were property. They were owned. And we think about that. It was common. And I want to say this. It was common. It was normal for there to be slavery. Uh, this man here, Philemon, lived around Colossae, it seems like, and he was a slave owner. And uh, it was just part of the culture. It's just what uh, the Roman uh, culture had allowed. It was legal for him to have a possession. And you think about it from inside. You can see uh, Philemon, one day, he has businesses, he has things going on, and somehow he purchases a slave. And let's say his name is Onesimus. He bought this slave. It is now his property. He owns this slave, and he works this slave. By the way, uh, as a, uh, uh, a slave owner right there, we could say that maybe he treated his slave good. Maybe he treated his slave bad. We don't know. Amen. We look at the, uh, slavery is a very touchy subject, as it should be, and I understand that. When we're going back here, and we're looking at what had happened here. There was Onesimus. He was the slave. And think about that. Uh, maybe he did have an owner that was good to him. Maybe not. We don't know that for sure. But there was certain bondage, a certain bondage in being a slave. Uh, you had no freedom. Uh, think about that. If you were married and had children, there were some problems down the uh, stream. Your wife or your children could be sold off as slave. Think about if your master dies, uh, the change. You may go from, quote, unquote, a good master to a master that was hard, giving you hard in bondage. And it was a terrible, terrible system. Can I say it was a terrible, terrible system? Amen. But it was the roots of slavery were deep in the Roman Empire. And here with this Onesimus, if you can imagine, one day, he, he's had enough. He's tired of being a slave. And there were severe punishments. If you ran away as a slave and you were caught being a slave, uh, many slaves were executed and killed. And here Onesimus, if you could uh, just imagine, begins to make a plan. I, I, I can't take it anymore. I'm living here around the region of Colossae. I've got to make an escape. I've got to get out of here. And Onesimus somehow breaks out of his role as a slave, and he begins to run for his life. And think about that. You know, where am I going to go? Uh, how am I going to live? I have no friends. I have no uh, anything right there. But he breaks off, and he travels somehow from Colossa uh, and works his way over here to uh, around the Macedonian Peninsula, or Macedonia, and somehow he goes over across into Italy, and somehow makes it to Rome. And, and it's a miracle that a way God worked things out, eventually 
he has met uh, the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul's in prison. And you can imagine, one day, somehow they meet. Maybe Onesimus is in prison. Uh, maybe Onesimus is around uh, trying to uh, work some, uh, some uh, work and try to make some money or something like that, but he's around the prison culture. But one day, he's introduced, introduced to Paul. Paul gives him the gospel. Onesimus, uh, let me tell you, you are a sinner. And uh, all sinners are going to have to pay for their sin one day when they die. And if you pay for it yourself, Onesimus, you're going to have to pay for it by dying and going to hell. But let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus paid that price. Uh, Jesus Amen. loves you. Uh, Jesus cares for you. He died on the cross for your sin. And Onesimus gets gloriously saved. saved. Now think about it with me. Onesimus gets saved. Praise God. He's a saved man. Imagine with me, if you will, the Apostle Paul begins to talk to Onesimus, and he says, Onesimus, God gave me a letter. I've written it down here, and I need you. I know a little bit about your background. I know how you came from Colossa. There's a man there named Philemon. He's your master. And uh, this letter right here, I want you to, to take this letter, and I want you to return. I want you to go back. I want you to go back and humble yourself and and just go back and uh, share with Philemon this letter right here. This right here. And imagine Onesimus. He is saved. He's bound for glory. But, he, you know, he ran from that situation. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. Understandably so. Right. He tried to get out of that situation. And here is, first of all, Apostle Paul, his spiritual leader, saying, Go, go back. Go back. And imagine him taking that letter... And he begins to, to make that long journey back across the sea here, across Macedonia, across the Aegean Sea, and he begins to travel. And imagine him getting to the outskirts of the city of Colossae. And uh, he would ran from there. Boy, he doesn't know. His master uh, is going to be angry with him, upset with him, maybe even cast him into prison, maybe uh, do uh, uh, some torture him or, or whip him. And you, you think about it, he, he got back there. And he handed that letter over to Philemon, his master. And he had, hey, I met Paul. I met him in Rome. He sent me back to, the, to here, and he's given you, me this letter. And imagine the emotions of the man named Philemon, seeing a man who ran from him. It's been a long journey. It's been a long time. Uh, the man probably has aged and uh, things are changed slightly and different, but all of a sudden he opens up that letter and he begins to read it. Now go with me to Philemon. Here we are. Onesimus is right here. Paul, this is the letter. Uh, Philemon's reading it. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, a brother, unto Philemon. Hey, that's me, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Yeah, I know the Apostle Paul. Boy, he, he's the man of God. He's the one that started these churches. He's been around here in Colossae right there. Verse number two. And to our beloved Apphia and our Chippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, understand these first seven verses are an introduction. It's sort of a long introduction. You know, you think 25 verses, seven verses are introduction, right? Verse 3, once again, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of the, the always in my prayers. Stop right there. It's an introduction. Hey, Paul's praying for me. That's interesting. And he's, he's finally, he's reading this. He got a letter from Paul. The mixed emotions, right? Here's my, my slave, Onesimus, and all of a sudden Paul is praying for me. Verse 5, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. By the way, can I, can I, when you look at this, it's, it's hard to, to say the whole picture. Philemon had slaves, which is wrong. Amen. It's, it's, it's problematic, and Paul's going to get to this in a moment. And it's, it's hard, though, because he did have some things that he was doing good. He had a love for God. He had a, love, he had a faith. Amen? Amen? There were some good parts of his Christian walk, and there were some bad parts of his Christian walk. And the Apostle Paul starts off saying, hey, I'm praying for you, but I've heard of thy love and faith, 
which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Now stop right this verse a second. I'm just going to say, Philemon had some problems, but he had some good traits also. Amen. And Apostle Paul started off, and just because Philemon did have some problems, some difficulties, some things that were not pleasing to the Lord, the Apostle Paul started off and saw some good in Philemon. Amen. And I think this is very, very important for all of us. Your pastor is not perfect. Far from it. Amen? Amen. But hopefully you can look over some of Pastor Nettesheim's fault and see some good that I'm trying to do. Boy, me also, when I look out in the congregation, uh, we, I, I see that we're an imperfect congregation. Almost perfect, but not quite there. Amen. And, and I look out there, and hopefully you believe that I, I see mostly good. I see that they're, they're imperfect people that are trying to serve the Almighty God. And see, the Apostle Paul uh, was able to look at Philemon. Though he was not perfect, he had hope for Philemon. He had a dream for Philemon. He believed that God uh, could still help uh, guide along. In other words, the Christian life is not always a position where you're at, but it's a direction. And we have to have patience with people. Somebody gets gloriously saved, and, and they're not following the Lord as they should in some areas. Hey, let's give them a little bit of time. Let's have some hope for them as they grow and learn in the Lord that they're, they can grow in the Lord. They can uh, correct some of those areas. Amen. Let's not write them off at the beginning. But look at this. This is really interesting. Verse number eight. In this, this section, I called, I called it a bold request. The letter continues on. The introduction is done. Verse eight. Wherefore, though I might be much, what? Bold, bold in Christ to enjoin thee, uh, enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Verse number 10. I beseech thee, in other words, this bold request, he says, I'm turning it about this man that I sent back to you, Onesimus, I'm begging you to think about something. I'm begging you, uh, Philemon, to think about something. Here Onesimus is at your doorstep. Here Onesimus is delivering your letter. Here I believe that you're strong in the Lord. I believe that you love the Lord. But I'm making a bold request to you. Think about something, right? Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. What do you mean son Onesimus? What do you mean son Onesimus? Whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might be, have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever." Now, I'm going to stop right there and get to verse 16 in a second. It's a letter, and Philemon's beginning to read about it, and Paul's making a bold request, saying, Philemon, you, you have sent this letter with a purpose. I'm making a bold request for you, and I'm begging you to think about something I've said. Slavery's normal for you. It's normal in our empire. It's normal in Rome right there. It's not even uh, against the law to have slaves. But I'm making a bold request to you. This Onesimus that ran from you, this Onesimus who was your slave, got gloriously saved. And I'm sending him back. Yes, I'm sending back. But the bold request, look at verse number 16. Look at this. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. Read this with me. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. Read that again with me. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. As a brother, beloved especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. He's saying, listen, receive him not as a slave, but as a brother. 
Receive him not as a servant, but uh, somebody who is an equal to you. Receive this man, Onesimus. Change your thinking for a second. You think, thought of him as your slave, your property. He's not. He's a brother beloved. Amen. 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 But you're going to get something right here. Change your thinking, Philemon. This is normal in the culture. This is normal in society. But this is different. Onesimus is not a, should not be your slave. He should be your brother. Wow, this is awesome. It is awesome. And I'm going to turn it on all of us in a minute, myself included, because <laughs> I know where it's coming. It's coming. We amen now. You just wait a couple seconds. <laughs> on SMS or Philemon, think about your view of slavery, and I want you to make a change. Think of your view of slavery, and I want you to be done with it. And I love verse 20, 20 and 21. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in this observed, uh, uh, confidence in thy obedience, having confidence in thy obedience, having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing, knowing, knowing that thou wilt uh, also do more than I say. <laughs> he said, man, I know you love the Lord. I know you've been ingrained with the culture of slavery, but you know what? Once you realize it's not right with the Lord, it's not the right thing to do, I know that you're going to be obedient to the Lord, and I know that you're going to even do more than I say. That's awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. Okay, Philemon. The culture. Nothing wrong with slavery. It's normal. 50% of the people in that time, it's slavery. It's normal, right? I have slaves, you have slaves, everybody has slaves. You're either a slave or you're a slave owner. It's normal in the culture. Okay, for us, you know, you think about me being saved. I got gloriously saved in 1994. Boy, my cultural background, woo! Man, I was steeped in the world's culture, you might say. The world's music, the world's philosophy. The Bible opened up a new chapter to my life. And all of a sudden, the preacher got up and he began to preach, thus saith the Lord, began to preach truth. And right there, the preacher wasn't preaching at me as far as saying, I'm a terrible, wicked, rotten person. He's saying, hey, you trust to the Lord as your Savior. You're growing in your faith and your walk toward the Lord. Hey, listen, you've been ingrained with some cultural things and things of the past that uh, were right to you that were no big deal. Everybody does it, but it's time to make a change, Matt Nettesheim. It's trying to realize that the culture is wrong. It's time to uh, change what you're doing in life. Yes, sir. That's right. And I had a choice. By the way, my pastor believed in me. He believed that I could make a choice. I could make a choice that would please the Lord. He, he believed that I would be obedient to the faith. Not only be obedient, but I would go even beyond that. Try to please the Lord with my life. By the way, that, that's an example of uh, the Bible. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he's uh, actually at that time Saul. He gets gloriously saved, and immediately, it didn't matter his culture of the past. It, by the way, he's Jewish, steeped in culture, steeped in tradition, was it not? But he's changed everything. All of a sudden, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? His will no longer mattered. His background no longer mattered. The only thing that mattered to the Apostle Paul was, Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, this is like a phenomenal truth. It's an amazing truth. Uh, I want to give you a bold request. By the way, I begin to learn some things. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Amen. That, that's interesting. Amen. The world has different opinions. You know, if it's good for you, go ahead and do it. If it's good for somebody else, go ahead and do it. Well, the Bible says something different. I want to make a bold request and realize that Jesus is the only way to heaven. There are many people out there who are steeped in false religions right there. They may be sincere, but they can be sincerely wrong. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. By the way, I make a bold request of all of us, simply to believe the Bible that Jesus is the only way. Well, my, my grandmother, she's been a, a, a Catholic, or my grandmother has been a devout Hindu, or my grandmother has converted to being a Muslim right there, and they're so sincere. How can they be so sincere and be wrong? Listen, I make a bold request to you. They can be sincere as much as they want, but the Bible simply says that the only way to heaven is Jesus. 
and we ought to be obedient to the word of God. It doesn't matter the culture. It doesn't matter what people think. Jesus is the only way. Amen. Okay, we go a little bit further. Uh, uh, the Bible's the word of God. Amen. The Bible is the word of God. Th this is an, a ma major issue. Many people think it's, a, it's the good book. <laughs> It's the good book. I mean, that's a good book. I mean, full of good stories and has some good truth in there. And, but you pinpoint it a little bit for the Bible. It is the good book, but it's the word of God. Amen. It is perfect. Zero errors. What it says in the Bible is true. Amen. 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 It is perfect. Amen. Amen. And, and when you pin it on that. Culture says it's a good book. Almost everybody in the world says good book and has some good truths. But let's go a little bit further and realize it's the word of the living God. And it doesn't matter what culture thinks. It matters what the Bible says. It claims to be the word of God. It is the word of God. I don't want to believe. I want to change my mind and, and go from thinking, by the way, I thought it was a good book, but I didn't, I didn't fully comprehend that it was the living word of God. And so I had to make a, a, a choice. I had to turn off from my old cultural thoughts that it's a good book, it has some errors in it, to realize this book is, is perfect. Amen. Okay, we go a little bit further. Uh, God created everything in six literal days. I had some problems with that. Why? I went to science class. Science told me that it was millions of years. And so I was steeped in that. And then when my preacher got up and said, Thus saith the Lord, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and did it in six literal days. Boy, I had to step back. That's some cultural change for me. I know it says right there, and he's being bold. He says, hey, I believe that you'll obey the truth of God's word and simply believe it, though you don't understand it. Hey, I expect that you would follow that and go even farther than that. Hey, turn away from the thought of millions of years and solely trust that the Bible says it's true. Six literal days. Amen. It's hard for people. Amen. It's hard, but I believe the book. Yes, sir. Boy, I've cast off that cultural thought right there. By the way, the Bible answered that. Science falsely so-called. Amen. Amen. But we turn away from the culture and we turn to the Lord and what the Lord wants. Onesimus delivered this letter. The letter gets to Philemon. He could have said, what's wrong with slavery? Everybody does it. What's wrong with this? It's what we do in our culture. What, what, what are people going to say when I begin to not have slaves anymore? How am I going to make a living if I don't have a slave? How am I going to live a life of ease unless I don't, I don't have slaves? But none of that mattered anymore. It didn't matter. What mattered was his obedience to the Almighty God. Culture didn't matter anymore. God mattered to him. This is phenomenal. Uh, living for the Lord is not a burden but a blessing. Oh, if you have to go serve the Lord, Brother Brian, I just want to let you know, I'm going to feel sorry for you. Boy, they're going to make you miss out on, you know, Sunday night football. Oh, yeah. We can watch the Redskins lose another game, my friend. It's not worth watching. It's worse if you're a Cowboys fan. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But you're going to miss out, my brother. I mean, serving the Lord's so difficult and so hard. And, you know, you could, I mean, you could do something with your life. You could have fun with your life. You can eat, drink, and be merry. It's going to be great. By the way, the world feels sorry for us. But they don't even understand. It's good. Being a part of a Bible-believing church is good. Uh, you, it's wonderful going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. I love Wednesday night service. I love looking back. We look back from last Wednesday night service when we prayed for a van. One week later, God raised up fifteen thousand dollars and gave, gave us two vans at the prices we wanted. Amen. It, it's awesome. It's serving God is good. Amen. And what we have to do is we have to realize culture. Shut out the culture. Okay, entertainment. We were good until I said that. I think one of the downfalls of a Bible-believing church is a congregation that's saturated in the world's entertainment. Amen. I think one of the downfalls of a good Christian family that loves God is a family that is saturated in the world's entertainment. I think it is. And we put our blinders down often, and we saturate ourselves, saturate our lives with the world. 
Everybody does it. I mean, everybody has Netflix today, so Christians ought to get Netflix too. I mean, just come on now. Everybody watches movies. You know, preachers used to preach against going to Hollywood movies. You know, you get a preacher that says up today, ye, who is he but a legalistic person? Legalist, you're a legalist now, aren't you? You're a legalist, pastor. You bring that up, movies right there. Listen, it, we live in a terrible culture. It, it is embarrassing what's on TV today. Amen. It is embarrassing. Amen. And, and I, I tell you what, I, got, <laughs> I went to, and I already probably mentioned this, but I, I went to eat at a pizza place. And with my wife, a week, a week ago last Tuesday, they had the WWE up there. And, man, these half-naked guys hugging each other. It was embarrassing. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't want to look at it, so I tried to look out the window, and the window just was a reflection of it. <laughs> so then I looked straight forward, and straight forward had a reflection of it, too. And so finally I asked the lady to please just turn it off. She says, well, I'll, I'll change the channel to a family channel. A family sitcom was worse than WWE. <laughs> it was terrible. And adultery, fornication, homosexuality, all is preached. And I, I just watched, I mean, I, I couldn't help but watch it for a few minutes. I'm embarrassed about it. I felt dirty. But entertainment... All of a sudden, the preacher makes a bold statement. He's bold. I'm begging you to think about what you watch. I'm begging you to make some decisions, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, the Bible says. Amen. Amen. And in the way it's worded, by the way, in the book of Ephesians, and have no fellowship, no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Not only don't have any fellowship with the unfruitful, hey, have, the, have the goal to say it's wrong. Not just a preacher, but a, a husband, a wife. Amen. Amen. Saying we're not going to have that in our home. Amen. 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 We're not going to watch that. We're going to turn it off. Amen. 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 Now, that, that's hard when you look at the culture. But it was hard for Philemon. Philemon had to make a choice. But praise God, he, he made the choice. Okay, go to this, gender distinction. We were with you, Pastor. <laughs> we're with you, Pastor. You always got to harp at that. It's like your pet peeve, isn't it, Pastor? Well, listen, God created them male and female. And we have some ishkus, ishkus. I, I, I could mix it with a sodomy and homosexuality. Uh, first openly gay governor elected in our nation in Colorado, a state that I lived at for many years, they've been smoking. So <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> Something's happened over there. <laughs> I shouldn't have said it like that. But something's wrong. Something's wrong. And there's a lot of things in our culture that are wrong. And I, I pray that we have the boldness, the boldness to accept a bold statement by the Apostle Paul. And rather than getting angry at it, we simply humble ourselves. We make some hard decisions in our life. And we fall in line with the Word of God. Amen. If we don't, we're caught up in the culture, we've, we've lost it. We've missed it. We're... we're we're having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Yes, sir. The Bible says, from such, turn away. Yes, sir. It's an amazing thing. We'll end with this. If you, you look at the, the last part of this thing, and uh, prayer, verse 22, uh, verse 22. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust through your prayers I shall be given unto you. And he was saying, hey, Philemon, praise God for your prayers. Keep praying for me. I trust that your prayers... Uh, God's going to answer them. The last three verses of a lot of names. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Paul remembered people, and I thought that was pretty amazing. Paul in prison was remembering people. Amen. This is a phenomenal book. 25, uh, 25 uh, verses challenged me. Challenged me. 
And by the way, if Philemon was challenged 2,000 years ago, accepted that challenge and changed, I think we can accept some challenges too. Not get mad at the challenge, but we can accept those challenges and make a change, a worthwhile change in our life. Let's pray.